Samsaya Pini Vartita Brahma Gunatmane Namaha Pini Vartita Brahma Gunatmane Namaha Jagatut Pava Stiti Laeshu Daivato Jagatut Pava Stiti Laeshu Daivato Bahu Vityamana Gunayatma Maya Bahu Vityamana Gunayatma Maya Atma Veda Matayesva Samstaya Rachidatma Veda Matayesva Samstaya Vini Vartita Brahma Gunatmane Namaha Vini Vartita Brahma Gunatmane Namaha Vaishnavis Jagat Uthava Sthitila Yeshu Daivato Jagat Uthava Sthitila Yeshu Daivato Bahu Pityamana Gunayatma Maya Rachitatma Veda Matayesva Samstaya Rachitatma Veda Matayesva Samstaya Vinivartita Brahma Gunatma Nenamaha Vinivartita Brahma Gunatma Nenamaha
There's a class of philosophers who misunderstand the appearance of the personality of Godhead within this material world. They are under the impression that when the Supreme Personality of God appears, he is under the spell of the three qualities, like all the other living entities who appeared in this material world. That is their misunderstanding, as it is clearly stated here, Svasamstaya. By his internal potency, he is transcendental to all these material qualities. Similarly, in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, I appear by my internal potency. Both the internal and external potencies are under the control of the Supreme, so he does not come under the control of either of these potencies. Rather, everything is under his control. In order to manifest his transcendental name, form, quality, pastimes and paraphernalia, he brings into action his internal energy. On account of the variegatedness of the external potency, there are manifestations of many qualitative demigods beginning with Brahma and Lord Shiva. And people are attracted to these demigods according to their own material quality. But when one is transcendental or surpasses the material qualities, he is simply fixed in the worship of the Supreme Personality. This fact is explained in Bhagavad Gita. Anyone engaged in the service of the Lord is already transcendental to the righteousness and interaction of the three material qualities. The summary is that the conditioned souls are being pulled by the action and reaction of the material qualities, which create a differentiation, differentiation of energies. But in the spiritual world, the worshipable one is the Supreme Lord and no one else. Om Ajnana Dimarandasya Ganjana Shalakaya Chakshuram Militam Vinatas Mashi Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Rupisham Sapitam Yabutale Swayam Rupa Gramayam Dati Swabrantikam Jay Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Shri Adveda Gadadha Shri Gosari Goda Bhakta Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Hare the words once more we offer our respectful basis unto the supreme who has created varieties of manifestations and put them under the spell of the three qualities of the material world in order to create, maintain, and annihilate them. He himself is not under the control of the external energy in his personal feature. He is completely devoid of the variegated manifestation of material qualities, and he is under no illusion of false identification. Jiro Prabhupada opens the purport by um, stating that two situations are described in this verse. One is the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of the material world, and the other is the Lord's own establishment. So the two main categories of creation and manifestations are being pointed out, and at the moment the great mystics are speaking, we are still in the uh, scenery where the Lord appeared in his eight-armed Vishnu feature within uh, the arena of sacrifice where Daksha was again performing, and different personalities offer their prayers according to their consciousness. And in the previous verse, the sages um, pointed out the limitations of their own perceptions, and there's discussion of monism, personalism, and also here Sri Prabhupada in this purport quite emphatically states um, how Krishna is a transcendental personality, not just transcendental in terms of transcendent energy, but that he is a transcendent personality, and that one should very carefully distinguish between that what we call material world and spiritual world. And I would like today that we have a look at the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna is speaking uh, about his own abode in Bhagavad Gita. There are actually, in my understanding, only two shlokas. One shloka is very indirectly pointing to that abode, and one shloka a bit more directly, because 
actually in the spiritual world is a confidential matter, as Krishna's personality, his um, pastimes are actually rather confidential, the different degrees of confidentiality. And also the Bhagavad Gita builds up like what Krishna is saying, this is uh, confidential knowledge, this is more confidential knowledge, this is most confidential knowledge. So he makes clear some gradations. And then we then hear something from the Srimad Bhagavatam, where certain personalities share their own experience of the Vaikuntha worlds, because I like this phrasing of your poet but create the Lord's own establishment what he has there um, the Vaikuntha planets and there are beautiful descriptions in the Srimad Bhagavatam already in the second canto we hear Lord Brahma himself um, or his account so to speak how he entered Vaikuntha Loka how he face to face spoke with the Lord they shook hands Vishnu expressed his um, satisfaction with Brahma and blessed him to do the creation work and then later on in the third canto, actually also Lord Brahma is narrating, um, but it's the story of the four Kumaras and how they entered by Kunta Loka, which makes the entrance into the whole pastimes how Jai and Vijay occurs, and then here in the Akshara and Kashipu uh, appear in this material world. So there are some beautiful descriptions that I would like that we um, um, absorb in them so that I get some glimpses into this spiritual vote because I think we quite extensively um, in the last month and year we went to the third canto and there's a lot of Sankhya philosophy also in this canto we get so much about the material nature and how it works. I think it's also important to put quite some emphasis and give some space to the spiritual manifestation because we are supposed to develop some attachment, some longing, some desire to go back to Krishna. So in order to long for something, to desire something, we must know what are we longing for, what do we desire for. If it's something that is completely unknown to us, how can we fully desire it? Because we must somehow other um, focus it. So therefore I would like to emphasize that. Um, you know. So in the Bhagavad Gita, we find in the 8th chapter, we recently spoke about the 8th chapter, um, which is entitled um, How to Attain the Supreme or Attaining the Supreme and there in verse um, 20 and 21 Krishna says Parastasmat dubhavonyo vyakto vyaktat sanatanaha yasa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyatsu na vinashyati Yet there is another unmanifest nature which is eternal and is transcendental to this manifested and unmanifested matter. It is supreme and is never annihilated. When all of this world is annihilated, that part remains as it is. In this short purport of Sri Prabhupada, Krishna's superior spiritual energy is transcendental and eternal. It is beyond all the changes of material nature which is manifest and annihilated during the days and nights of Brahman. Krishna's superior energy is completely opposite in quality to material nature. Superior and inferior nature are explained in the seventh chapter. So here we again get some um, points that help us dis distinguish between the natures. We can also say um, there's a difference between manifestation and creation. The material world is created, means it, it functions within time. There's a beginning in time, has an end in time and time is dictating, so to speak, the manifestation and unmanifestation. Whereas the spiritual world is an um, eternally present, manifested uh, world, which constantly also expands, um, and it remains as it is, there's no deterioration. And also the nature is such an ananda, in the spiritual world everything is eternal, fully conscious, blissful, there's uh, nothing that causes in any way suffering or fear, Whereas the material world is asad, achit, and nir ananda. It means it's based on time, it is uh, temporary, things come and go. Um, achit is full of uh, ignorance, we are unconscious, we do not know really what is the reality. And then nir ananda full of unhappiness. So therefore we are required to 
give some attention to the Shastras and how they explain us that there is a higher abode available to us where we are actually supposed to be. And then in text 21, um, 821, Krishna says, Avyakto kshara yam yam That which the Vedantists describe as unmanifest and infallible, that which is known as the supreme destination, that place from which, having attained it, no one ever returns, that is my supreme abode. So this is a rather abstract description. We're pointing out actually the nature of eternity and the perfect, that is a perfect place. So we don't get so much detail, we just get basically a distinction how it is not material, or like how it's distinct from material nature. And then in the ninth chapter, um, in text um, 6, um, Krishna says, Nata Pasha Tsaiti Suryo Nasha Shampuna Pavakaha Yatkat Vanavartante Tatama Parma Mama. Again, the last phrase, my supreme abode, is that which is not um, um, illumined by sun or moon. Nata Pasha Tsaiti Suryo Nasha Shampuna Pavakaha. No electricity, no sun or moon is necessary to, to illuminate, it. it is self luminous. So, in that um, Supreme Board is that what we are supposed to attain, and Krishna and Sri Prabhupada in the purport to this um, verse 15.6 is saying that one should be captivated by this information and one should develop a strong desire to go there. So again we have to point Sri Prabhupada himself emphasizing how there's necessity to develop the desire to go back to God, to the spiritual world. So, and there we come to the point um, of the Srimad Bhagavatam, where we can hear the descriptions, or some of the descriptions, of how the um, Kumaras entered that establishment of the Lord. And Brahma is giving the account. Um, we find that in the... Um, we find it in the third canto, in chapter 15, and is entitled, The Description of the Kingdom of God. And so we are in the middle of it here when Brahma is speaking and he says, after thus traveling all over the universes, they, the four Kumaras, also entered into the spiritual sky, for they were freed from all material contamination. In the spiritual sky there are spiritual planets, known as Vaikuntas, which are the residents of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his pure devotees, and are worshipped by the residents all the material planets. So here we get already a bit more detail. Um, the spiritual world consists, of course, of spiritual planets, Vaikuntas, in which different forms of the Supreme Lord reside, and also, of course, his devotees are there, and there's constant worship going on. And the next verse states, In the Vaikuntha planets, all the residents are similar in form to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They all engage in devotional service to the Lord without desires for sense gratification. The residents and the form of living in Vaikuntha are described in this verse. The residents are like the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan. In the Vaikuntha planets, Krishna's plenary feature as forehand Narayan is the predominating deity, and the residents of Vaikuntha Loka are also forehanded just contrary to our conception here in the material world. Nowhere in the material world do we find a human being with four hands. In Vaikuntha Loka there is no occupation but the service of the Lord. And this service is not rendered with a purpose. Although every service has a particular result, the devotees never aspire for the fulfillment of their own desires. Their desires are fulfilled by rendering transcendental loving service to the Lord. So this verse in purpose, we hear even more about the atmosphere in Vaikuntha and what's going on there and how also the different personalities look like. In the second canto, also when Brahma is uh, giving his account, he mentions how also, of course, different personalities in the Vaikuntha planets have different complexions. Like, they could be bluish, sky bluish, like the Lord himself. They could also be like coral and they could be also like a 
green. So in different types of complexions, colors, there's unlimited variety. And not to be equated with the colors, of course, from the world, but... So. Um, but of course, they're completely of a different nature. Um, but we need to, of course, we need to use the words that are available to our mind to describe them. And what I would like to emphasize is the point in this purport. The Shri Prabhupada says, in Vaikuntha Loka there is no occupation but the service of the Lord. And this service is not rendered to the purpose. We also are wanted to practice devotional service simply for the sake of sharing and giving ourselves to the Lord and in this way automatically being fulfilled. And sometimes we hear, also recently in a, or not so long back in the seminar, I also again asked the Prabhu who spoke um, about this statement because somehow it doesn't add up to me or doesn't make sense that sometimes we hear in Vaikuntha um, there's no really service, there's kind of a chill out. And I was wondering um, how, how do we base that on Shastra? It doesn't seem to me like, for example, in this verse in purple, it makes, makes, it makes clear nowhere in the spiritual world is there something like not serving the Lord. It, it, even in order to enter any sphere of the um, Aikunta Lokas, might it be the world of Narayan, might it be Ayodhya, where Lord Ram is residing, might it be Mathura, or Goloka, the qualification is that you are a pure servant of the Lord and you have an established relationship with the Lord, which means automatically loving service. There's no one just hanging out in, in the spiritual world, not having any service to the Lord. It's, it's just not existing. That's completely contrary to the whole understanding of what the spiritual world is. So, therefore, I would like to emphasize that statement here in this purport. You know, we understand whatever uh, the service might differ, the mood might differ, the relationship type might differ compared to the different spheres of the spiritual world, but there's always essentially the loving service to the Lord. And there's no one who's not actively engaged in any service to Krishna or to Narayan, to Ramachandra, and to whomever he might have his inter ex, uh, intrinsic relationship. So he continues, in the Vaikuntha planets uh, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the original person, who can be understood through the Vedic literature. He is full of the uncontaminated mode of goodness, with no place for passion or ignorance. He contributes religious progress for the devotees. In those Vaikuntha planets, there are many forests which are very auspicious. In those forests, the trees are desire trees, and in all seasons, they are filled with flowers and fruits because everything in the Vaikuntha planets is spiritual and personal. So, in more detail, this Vaikuntha, or the spiritual world, is the original world, and there we find everything that we find here in its original version, which means also in its most um, sublime and powerful feature. And the purpose says, in the Vaikuntha planets, the land, the trees, the fruits and flowers and the cows, everything is completely spiritual and personal. The trees are desire trees, which means it's like, some, we hear, hear that when we are small, I don't know how it's in, in English and German, it's the Schlafenland, or how do they call it in English? This land, the space where honey flows and milk and, and food flows in flies into your mouth, all these kind of things. And it's considered, of course, a dream of any living being to simply enjoy itself without having to do anything. So it might be connected to, yeah, yeah, dream on. That's, that's something. You know. But we take Shastra as an authoritative source that tells us there's a different type of nature. It's not a material nature, a spiritual nature, which doesn't require hard work and labor, which is in itself blissful and rewarding and full of enjoyment on different platform, and that the trees offer you anything you desire. It's not about only food. They can grant you practically anything. But automatically, these things that you get there, they are dovetailed in the service of Krishna and the devotees. On this material planet, the trees can produce fruits and flowers according to the order of material energy. But in the Vaikuntha planets, the trees, the land, the residents, and the animals are all spiritual. 
there is no difference between the tree and the animal, or the animal and the man. Here the word mutimat indicates that everything has a spiritual form. Formlessness as conceived by the impersonalist is refuted in this verse. In the Vaikuntha planets, although everything is spiritual, everything has a particular form. The trees and the men have form, and because all of them, although differently formed, are spiritual, there is no difference between them. So it's another Im important feature that we have in the spiritual world um, compared to the material world. Here we are in the realm of duality and distinction. Um, one thing excludes the other, or one thing is very different from another. Whereas there, although there is an apparent difference, at the same time there is oneness or unity within the forms. As we say, we have gradations, we have lower species, higher species, we distinguish them based on their level of consciousness, based on their shapes, based on their development of senses, based on their capacity to act. So, then we say, this is higher, this is lower, that one is different from another, one can't even relate to another. Some animals you can train, you can have some level of communication with them. But many animals, like insects, not at all. Or to speak in human beings among themselves, <laughs> they sometimes can properly relate to another. Or things, you know, I can't have a relationship with the chair or with the thing that it can, you cannot. In a very impersonal relationship, I use it, so that's the relationship. But it doesn't exchange. But in the spiritual world, everything is personal, and that's, let's just stay with that thought, that everything, that's also a language condition, a thing is by definition not personal, because it's a thing. Also in German you have, um, in the language, this object, you know, object, it's the Sache, it's a thing, so it's also no gender. Um, so, but in the spiritual world, obviously, every, everything is a person. And this can be just also one content for meditation, how this is extremely wonderful <laughs> and hard to even imagine. That's the statement of Shastra. So in the Vaikuntha planets, the inhabitants fly in their airplanes accompanied by their wives and consorts and eternally sing of the character and activities of the Lord, which are always devoid of all inauspicious qualities. While singing the glories of the Lord, they deride even the presence of the blossoming Madhavi flowers, which are fragrant and laden with honey. That's also a beautiful purport. It appears from this verse that the Vaikuntha planets are full of all opulences. They are airplanes in which the inhabitants travel in the spiritual sky with their sweethearts. Or what is it? <laughs> their sweethearts. There's a breeze carrying the fragrance of blossoming flowers, and this breeze is so nice that it also carries the honey of the flowers. The inhabitants of Vaikuntha, however, are not so or are so interested in glorifying the Lord that they do not like the disturbance of such a nice breeze. <laughs> Just look, listen to the sentence, the disturbance of such a nice breeze. Disturbance, nice. Have you ever been disturbed by something very nice? <laughs> <laughs> so, even so, the priority, even if this is all opulence and so beautiful, if it hinders us, so to speak, to glorify the Lord, then we do not welcome it. That's the mood there. Um, while they are chanting the Lord's glories, they do not appreciate such peace. In other words, they are pure devotees. They consider glorification of the Lord more important than their own sense gratification. No. In the Vaikuntha planets, there is no question of sense gratification. To smell the fragrance of a blossoming flower is certainly very nice, but it is simply, uh, simply for sense gratification. The inhabitants of Vaikuntha give first preference to the service of the Lord, not their own sense gratification. Serving the Lord in transcendental love yields such transcendental pleasure that, in comparison, sense gratification is counted as insignificant. So again here, what are the Vaikuntha Vasis busy with? Glorifying the Lord, singing, doing kirtan, chanting. So it's natural there, because this is what's going on. We have in the material world, everyone is looking, what's going on, what's the latest movies, what's the latest album of this and that person that we can think and speak about. But in Vaikuntha, the pastimes of the Lord are that, if there would be cinemas, 
when there is something like an original cinema in the spiritual world, then we know what will be the movie. You know, will be the, <laughs> it will be the pastimes of the Lord. You know, or if there's music, you know, always about glorifying Christmas pastimes. In this way, being absorbed in greatest transcendental happiness. So these are some descriptions, and the, the chapter, of course, offers more, and also the second canto where the Brahma is giving his account of the spiritual world, offers even more details. And there's an important statement Lord Brahma is making. He says, it is very much regrettable that unfortunate people do not discuss the description of the Vaikuntha planets, but engage in topics which are unworthy to hear and which bewilder one's intelligence. Those who give up the topics of Vaikuntha and take to talk of the material world are thrown into the darkest region of ignorance. Let's just shortly stay with the emphasis on how essential it is to discuss these topics, to hear about the spiritual world. In the beginning, I mentioned also, like when we read from the um, Bhagavad Gita from um, 915, where Krishna describes his spiritual boat as being self-luminous, and there's no sun or moon that needs to illuminate it, or like no electricity, and when one is in this place, one never returns. And how Prabhupada says in the purpose, one should be fascinated by that information, and one should develop a desire to attain that boat. So that is the priority in, in, in spiritual life, to develop spiritual desires. And sometimes we wonder, what is a spiritual desire? Right? Of course, the simple definition is a desire relating to a spiritual purpose. That might also mean a spiritual desire, I want to understand and realize the Atman. It could be, of course, a spiritual desire to understand your spiritual self. Or the more and more absorb being able to grasp the pastimes of Krishna or like his different forms and features. But also the spiritual desire is to develop a desire for liberation in a sense that I say, I don't want to stay in this world and serve the senses. I desire to be an original spiritual servant of the Lord in anywhere in the spiritual world, wherever Krishna wants me to be. Because over and over this is highlighted to us, we are here at a place that is not our home. And we have fake identities. We are like some people who uh, or say they escape some country or some reasons some criminals and they accept some fake identities and then live their lives. <laughs> so also we have accepted so many fake identities over so many yugas and God knows how long. And it's, it's about getting back to the original identity. And I understand that the statement of Sri Prabhupada one should be fascinated by this information as be fully open to believe it and to take it for real. Because those descriptions, as, as we said before, sometimes seems like a bit fairy tale like to the mind we have, how we are being trained or influenced by modern society. But we, are, we accept, if we accept the Vaishnava Acharyas and the Srimad Bhagavatam, we accept that as absolute truth. And we are supposed to also present this to the people as. This is uh, what our spiritual past is about, to get back to this original spiritual world. So we, of course, should also have faith in that and, and understand and have faith that this is available and achievable and attainable to us. So and it's very important to use one's time. It's also said, as long as the mind is capable, one should use it to meditate. Because we don't know how long is our mind and body working the way it works now. If we have already some limitation we can experience, we don't even have to be old to be limited. <laughs> it can, can be right from the start, it can be in between. So as long as the mind is working, if we can think clearly um, and thoroughly and and as long as you can recall things properly, remember things, absorb your mind, keep a focus for a longer time, then as long as one should really use it to, of course, chant the holy names of the Lord, but also study the Shastras, speak about the Shastras. Um, and in this way, develop the consciousness, the 
Krishna consciousness so that at the end of life, even if our body and mind do not work, um, we have some uh, something substantial there that, that our mind can pop up, not some material impression, but rather pops up with a spiritual impression in you know, consciousness. Mm -hmm. So Brahma is instructing you further. No, so actually this is here. Yes. So now it continues how the because it's about the four sages, um, the four Kumaras, Sanaka, Sanatana, Sananda, and Sanakumara, how they entered this realm. So this is what the description is about. And it says, Thus the great sages Sanaka, Sanatana, Sanandana, and Sanakumara, upon reaching the above mentioned by Kunta in the spiritual world, by dint of their mystic yoga performance, perceived unprecedented happiness. They found that the spiritual sky was illuminated by highly decorated airplanes, piloted by the best devotees of Vaikuntha, and was predominated by the Supreme Personality of God. So again, the um, um, atmosphere is highlighted, how one becomes fully happy, unprecedented happiness in the spiritual sky. And the next verse is stating, after passing through the six entrances of Vaikuntha Puri, the Lord's residence, without feeling astonishment at all, at all the decorations, they saw the seven gate, at the seven gate, two shining beings of the same age, armed with maces and adorned with most valuable jewelry, earrings, diamonds, helmets, garments, etc. The purpose says, the sages were so eager to see the Lord within Vaikuntha Puri that they did not care to see the transcendental decorations of the six gates which they passed by one after another. But at the seventh door, they found two doormen of the same age. The significance of the doormen's being of the same age is that in Vaikuntha planets there is no old age. So, no, so one cannot distinguish who is older than whom. So it's an interesting detail. I'm just thinking it makes sense in a way, if there's no old age, of course, you don't see anyone different from another in terms of age, they all appear the same, young. The inhabitants of Vaikuntha are decorated like the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, which Shankar, Chakra, Gada and Padma, Conch, Real, Club and Lotus. Have, has any one of you been to Sri Rangam? So then you know um, that in a sense, this temple um, is a, how to say, model in a way of, of this, what is described here. So we go to Sri Rangam, um, then first of all, it's very impressive if you see it from far, that the South Indian temples are these huge temples which many, many storages, you know, it's really high, you can see it from far. And the Sri Rangam temples is one of the most significant, they call it Dita Desham, um, holy place of pilgrimage, also one of the most significant 108 Vishnu temples in South India. And there you have also the gates. You pass through um, one gate after another, somewhere outside, but then I think the last two or three, I'm not sure anymore, they are inside. So gradually you actually go, in this material world you have a place where you enter also gate by gate, till you arrive also at the Lord Starshan, at Jai Vichai also, as Murtis are available on the side. When I first time went there, it was so beautiful, it was so... walking through that, to, to those gates, um, and thinking of that this is practically like the spiritual world, how you enter it, it was so full of promise, you know, to go there and to, to think of it like that, because the atmosphere is it's extremely special. It's, it's an enormous temple. I can give you even some numbers. Um, they say it's 156 acres of land, which is huge. It practically, you can consider the city in itself. And also, if you want to see everything in Sri Rangam, the temple, and it takes you a few days if you really want to properly take darshans and visit everything. Um, and it has seven enclosures. 
um, in seven or so thick walls, they call it rampart walls, shoots on, you know, like this. Um, and it is surrounded by the rivers Koweri and um, Kolarun in the state of Karnataka, South India. And it said the Murti itself originated from the Milk Ocean. They say it's you can have different stories that they self manifest. And many, always there's many deities you go there, the Pucharis, and people claim they're self manifest. And you don't know, we know the Lord can self manifest. And it was first worshipped by Bill Brahman and who gave it to Surya and then he gave it to his descendants. And then it was also worshipped by Lord Ramachandra himself. And actually Lord Ramachandra gave it to Vibhishan, the pious brother of Brahman. And there's the story, um, Naivisharanya Prabhu wrote a book about the life of Ramachandra. And this he also gives some account how this temple actually, how it is now, has been built. There had been a previous temple. I forgot the exact names of the Vaishnava saints that were involved. But one Vaishnava saint found that uh, Murti of, of uh, Randanath, uh, and it was neglected, the temple was not intact, there was practically not really a temple. So, and he felt it should be reestablished. And he, he went and asked different businessmen and rich Indian people, you know, to support it, but they didn't want to. This they felt no, not interested. And yet, the Vaishnava was saying had four associates, and these four associates, they had all a particular mystic power at their use. One could walk over water, and the other could, by simply stepping in the shadow of another, a kind of, um, not stun that person, but make it, the person can move, the person could move. If this, one person stood on the shadow. Another could be uh, could captivate the minds of others by his speech. Like when people speaking and talking something, complete absorption that they didn't notice anything around them. Uh, and the third one, he could um, pick any kind of locks. So that was his ability. So when it turned out that the parent was supposed to be pious Indian gentleman. We're not supporting the cause of re-establishing re -establishing Lord Ramanath's temple. Um, these Vaishnavas took to the path of robbers. They became a gang, practically. And they decided to s steal the money of those rich Indians to build the temple. Because they thought, well, actually everything is the property of the Lord and it's supposed to be engaged in the service of the Lord. They, these misers, these uh, 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 let's say, Duratmas, they want to keep it for themselves, so we have to take it by force. So then they started to um, collect <laughs> the money from the rich people. And also there, of course, they had, uh, this really rich people had protection, like we have here, if you have a, a little castles which are surrounded by a canal, water canal, so you can't really enter. But one person had the ability to walk over water, so he could go and then open the doors on the inside. And another person could, of course, lock pick. Another person could captivate the minds of either bystanders, potential witnesses, and so on. Others could um, make people immovable by standing on a shadow. So they used those mystic abilities to rob the rich people of their wealth, and then they built up gradually this this. Huge temple, it took them decades, I don't remember exactly how many decades, but quite a few decades. And they, they also grew, they became a big gang, many robbers, and uh, joined them. And then even at the end, when the temple was finally built, there was an agreement that the Vaishnava saint made with the robbers, saying, okay, at the end, we share the gold and stuff, we share it with you. And then was the time, and they said, okay, now it's time to pay, you know, payment day, you know, so. Then he noticed there was nothing left, everything went into the construction of the temple. Um, and then the robbers got quite uh, uneasy, and there was already thought of and word of killing the Vaishnavas, you know, because they cheated them, practically. And then the one person who could walk over water said, no, no, wait, no problem, we have stored some of the gold, but it's on an island there. Come with me in the boat and we take you there. You know, so all the robbers, they went on the boat with this 
Vaishnava scene. And he took them, and then at some point, I think it was, maybe it was of some storm, I'm not sure anymore, but from the distance, um, the Vaishnava scene could hear some crying, uh, like, you know, for it, because people were dying. And what happened is, the boat was drowned, and all the robbers died. And then the person who could walk on the water came back. And the Vaishnava saint said, yes, it's not an uh, ideal solution, but they will get benefited by the service they did for Ranganath. <laughs> In the end of it. So, it's an interesting story to, to hear about how the temple of uh, Ranganath has, has been established. Of course, if you Google, you find different stories of this king and that king had been, but in the, in the book of Namishwani Kuro, he gives this account. I can, I can check for the names. But it's certainly very, very um, beautiful to go to Sri Lanka. And I would just recommend everyone to make the tour to anyway south Indian temples, but particularly this place is very important, not just for the Sri Vaishnavas, also for us, it's something very. I think one has to see that at least once to be there and take a darshan of Sri Ramana. So because also there, in this temple stay, give you, if you're in a city which focuses simply on Vishnu, where everything is about Vishnu, you are practically more or less in the spiritual world. And therefore pilgrimage is so essential because it helps us to develop the desire to go back to the spiritual world. So, yeah, whenever you have, uh, I don't know when this whole COVID thing will be over, but if you have opportunity and go there, I would say do it. Also, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stayed there uh, for a whole rainy season in the house of Venkatabhata, great Acharya. And in this time, he also carved his very own special Jagannath deities. And they look completely different, not like this, as you can see there. First, when we first saw them, we thought they're something modern, someone in the 80s or something has, has shaped them because they, they looked a bit like Russian, like a bit cartoon like, we must say. I don't know how to describe it otherwise. And then, you know, okay. <laughs> they look completely different. They have really actually kind of human faces, and yeah, once, once you go there, you can witness yourself. So it's beautiful. So in essence, as the original Bhagavatam verse stated, there are two realms, spiritual material, and it's very essential to absorb the descriptions of the spiritual manifestations in order to develop also desire, first of all, an appreciation, an understanding, and then a desire to transfer yourself back to, as Sri Prabhupada said, back to Godhead. Are there any comments or questions? I mean, here in this word by word, we have now Bhavakaha, fire, comma, electricity. And this is also not the solution of Bhagavatam in the Sankha philosophy. Um, in one report of, or like one distinction of the elements, once fire is used, and once instead of fire, electricity. So it appears from here that the word Bhavakaha can be used in these two ways. Um, Ananda Vishnu once explained this with the word electricity and he said, well, well, don't use this, that we have a better, that we can grasp 
better the meaning of it, that there is even not electricity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you really study a bit the um, Sangha philosophy, then it's very uh, interesting when you enter into all the features one element has, you wouldn't even think of that. Because you, sometimes it sounds a bit simplistic, five core elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, and then what about all the chemicals and all this and all these energies and stuff? But in the system, everything is accommodated in a very systematic way, but one has to get the, uh, the methodology, and that requires a bit of study. In Brahma Samhita, there is a verse, Lakshmi is a hasta, so that's a Brahma right? description of the spiritual world. And I'm not sure exactly where, where I heard this, but I'm, I'm sure it's on one of Shadrava's purports. He mentions in the spiritual world by Punta Lokas, there is no really dust, but all the Lakshmi's, the goddesses of fortunes, and they are constantly engaged in cleaning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. This is actually also mentioned here in the third canto. I skipped those verses. They were, all the, the luxuries are described, and they say they're, they're busy sweeping the temples. Although there's no dust, but in this way they attract also the, the mercy of the Lord by the engagements of service. Mm -hmm. actually originates from fire because if there was no fire there wouldn't have been electricity I mean I, look, I can look it up which lecture but then I think if we just maybe study electricity a bit more um, we can figure out that the base of electricity is actually fire mm -hmm. and therefore I think it makes sense yeah. and we can take one simple phenomenon if there's thunder strike in a tree the tree starts to burn because the electricity kindles the fire so there's obviously some intrinsic connection. Thank you. Sorry. I have one comment and one question. Um, like while I was hearing these very beautiful, opulent descriptions of Vaikuntha, I was reminded of the story of Gopal Kumar, who went to Vaikuntha but he was so dissatisfied because ultimately our um, the uh, goal, let's say, of our spiritual life is going to open down. So although we hear these beautiful descriptions of Aikuntha, we can only imagine how much more beautiful and attractive going to open down it would be. And my question is that you mentioned how in uh, Aikuntha there are no gradations. But sometimes we hear that in Guru Pindavan there is a hierarchy, there are some confidential gopis or confidential gopas, etc. So is there such a hierarchy in service maybe in my contact too? Well, the non-distinctiveness was here referred to um, sarup or form. In the, in the verse mentioned in the third canto, the description is said, trees, animals, men, and objects, although they have different forms, they are all personalities, in that sense there's no difference between them, they are all on the same platform of being conscious spiritual beings, there's no, um, one is not more limited, so to speak, than another. Although the mood and way of service might differ. So my understanding is the oneness is highlighted, so that the duality that we experience in this material world between uh, inferior, superior species form of life is not present um, in Vaikuntha Loka. But certainly, as you also understand, there are like rasas, we say, it says Vaikuntha from the main five rasas it has two and a half. It means the Vaikuntha Vasis they experience Shantarasa, um, Dasaras, and some extent of Sakiras might also be there, different personalities. So this is the limitation, so to speak, of Vaikuntha, whereas then in Goloka all the five rasas can be experienced with Salya and Durya and so on, and the full uh, Sakiras. And also the um, additional eight rasas. And they manifest accordingly to the to the abode where Krishna empowers that, so to speak, or the rasas become possible. 
So there's some distinction, but the basis in terms of who you are in contrast of um, someone else in terms of the form you have, there is equality. There's no distinction in terms of um, yeah, the quality you have as a as a being. That's my understanding. Grant Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai 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 Jai